So what attracted you to the Unitarian Church? Well, I was introduced to the Unitarian Church by my in-laws, Martin and Muriel Zwick. I was married to their son, Patrick. And Martin had been the principal clarinetist in the Utah Symphony for many years, and Muriel had been quite an organizer and quite a woman of great influence in the arts community, and she'd also been the director of Friendship Manor, something that the, our church has been involved with since the beginning. So the two of them were people with a great deal of esteem and a great deal of involvement in the church. So they introduced me to the church, and Dylan, Patrick and my son, their grandson, was blessed by Dick Henry, oh, in 1980. And that was my first actual experience of being in the sanctuary, was when my son was blessed by Dick Henry. And it took me a few years um, to decide to go back. And some part of that was I just, I just needed more than what I had in my life. I needed more than my job. I needed more than my family. I needed, I needed some more connection to a higher purpose and more of a community. So I started taking Dylan to the preschool and I started attending church. And I would sit on the back row in Elliott Hall and leave as soon as it was over. Because I didn't want anybody to see me there. Because I knew if they did, I would start being asked to do things. And I wasn't ready for that yet. So I did that for about a year, and then I just said to myself, you know, this is, this, is where, this is where you belong. You might as well start being a part of things. So I presented myself and said, I, you know, I want to start doing stuff. So the first thing I did was I was involved with the very first church auction. A guy named Joel Morris, who had been a friend of mine in high school, was helping do this. He and his, he and his wife, Laurel. And they said, why don't you help out? And it was, you know, I'd done fundraising for years and years. And so I got a bunch of stuff for that first auction. And it was in Elliott Hall. And there were a bunch of hay bales around. And we had a potato bar. And there was maybe 50 people there. We raised a few thousand dollars. And I helped out with that for a few years, and then, of course, the auction got bumped up, and now it's an amazing affair. Now it's so much more than it was when it began, but that's the way I, I got introduced to the church, to doing more with the church. And then I taught RE for years and years and years. And then um, they asked me to do a children's choir. So I did. And I put together a children's choir, and that choir lasted for about seven years. And during that time, we made a CD called Love is a Circle, and we went back to Nashville for the 2000 GA and sang in this huge children's choir. What is GA? GA is General <laughs> Assembly. It is like when all the Unitarians get together. So GA is General Assembly, and they hold it every year in a different city. And it's like a huge convention. And that year was in Nashville. And so there were our, oh, there's probably 11 or 12 kids between 8 and 9, 10 that sang in this choir. And of course it was GA, so it was huge. It was this. So we all went to Nashville to the General Assembly. And there's all these children, this, this huge bank of children singing these amazing songs. Nick Pages, who's this amazing musician, was leading them. And the cameras were sweeping along and catching these lovely little faces and projecting them on these big screens where we could all see them. And the camera's banking along and picks up this cute little redhead, this kid named Baxter Heel, my son, who sees the camera and goes, and broke up the entire congregation. I mean, honestly, people were laughing throughout the entire hall, and they jerked the camera away as fast as they could from him. And the whole time there, he was the redhead kid. And everywhere we went, people would go, you're that redhead kid, aren't you? So it was a, it was a, it was a wonderful experience for our kids and a hilarious experience for Baxter. What some viewers may not know is that you have a long and uh, illustrious background in music. Perhaps you could share a little bit, maybe 20, 30 seconds with us about the saliva system. Oh gosh, well, my, my, my experience on stage and singing started when I was eight, 
and my sister and I won the Ted Mack Original Amateur Hour back before most people seeing this were born, and um, it was just downhill ever since then. <laughs> so I sang with my real sister for years and years and years, and then I went on the road and sang with a band. I sang with five or six different bands in Salt Lake City before being a saliva sister, so I had done a lot of singing before that. And then I got together with these two amazing women, and we put together the Saliva Sisters in about 1980. And we are still singing now, 2018. In fact, we have a gig this Saturday. Well, let's fast forward to 2018, where we are today. You are involved in the uh, First Unitarian Church uh -huh. Choir. Tell us about the choir. Well, the choir has just grown so remarkably, just like the whole congregation. But when, when David Owen took it over, when David Owens took it over, um, he started to build, and it is, it is a remarkable institution. It is almost an obsession, if not a passion, for some members of that choir, myself included. I mean, we do choir all week long. We have an email group that we converse with. Most of my very best friends that I hang with are all in the choir. I mean, there is such camaraderie and such sense of purpose and pleasure uh, with that group, and it's based entirely on David Owens and his great skill and his great talent, and now Dr. Zabriskie, David Zabriskie. So what David has done, David Zabriskie, Dr. David Zabriskie, because the choir had just gotten too big for its place in the church. There was no place to put everybody. So he peeled off 16 um, groups we had to audition for. You don't have to audition to be in the choir, but we had to audition for this group. And he peeled off 16 and called us the, the chancel, the chancel singers, right? It's, no, 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 it's the chancel choir and the chalice singers. So we're the chalice singers. And we get together on Tuesday nights and we just love it. We love it. We're singing inspiring music. We're singing well together. We've got this remarkable leader in Dr. Zabriskie and we've had two performances so far for the church. And the feedback has been wonderful. But our experience of it has been just phenomenal. In terms of musical experiences for me, there's been nothing like this. It's really good. Tell me about the relevance of the choir and music in general to the Unitarian experience. How, how do the two mesh and blend? And do you think that that is part of the appeal of this particular church? Oh, I have no question. It's part of the appeal of this church. There are a number of people I know that are active members of the church who came into the church through the choir. But it's not just that. It's just the fact that there's such an elevated sense of experience in our entire service. There's the remarkable sermons that, that Tom gives. There's the remarkable music that, that David, Zabriski bring, or David Owens brings. But over the years, we've had some phenomenal players. There was Stephen Emerson so long ago, who was a symphony player, a symphony cellist, who was like the musical director for a while and played and played and played. We've had Mary Craig here, who's one of the finest sopranos I've ever heard, who was a member of our congregation, sang beautifully for us for years and years. There was Martin Zwick, my father-in-law who was a marvelous clarinet player, a marvelous mandolin player, who played many times for our congregation. Patrick Zwick, his son, my ex-husband, who was a symphony player, who's played the mandolin there, who's played the guitar there. I mean, there has just been, I'm sure I'm leaving some out, Carl Johansson, who played so beautifully last Saturday, a member of the Utah Symphony, a viola player who's played for us many times. So the level of musicianship that is expected in our services is as high as it gets, you know, and it all lends itself so well to that sense of we're experiencing something excellent. It's something about humanity at its best that we get to experience every Sunday. Our lovely Tom Goldsmith said he wants music to be primary. He wants the church to be known for the music that's there. And he's setting things in motion to do that. David, Dr. David Zabriskie's is notable in that. So I believe that that tradition and that, that, that um, aspiration will, consider, will continue whether or not Tom's there or not. Several, several years ago, the choir was invited to sing at Carnegie Hall in New York City. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, that was 2010, and um, we, we had sing 
we sing requiems every year. And the, the Bradley Ellingbaugh Requiem is one that we had sung a year or two before, and this composer got the word out to people who'd purchased his music that they were going to be doing his Requiem in Carnegie Hall. So come on and come. So we said, oh yeah, we still want to do this, but we had to raise money to do it. So the choir just did everything we could imagine to raise money to get us all there, and we did. And without, ex I think there were one or two who couldn't make it, but pretty much all of us ended up going to Carnegie Hall and singing with the biggest choir ever, I can imagine. I mean, it got hilarious after a while, because row after row after row of human beings would go on there. I mean, there, had, there must have been 10,000 people in the choir there. And it was just the most amazing experience. For one thing, we had Bradley Ellingbow, who's this amazing musician and, and uh, composer and director and singer. And we were in his hands, or like putty in his hands. I mean, it was just a remarkable experience for all of us. Any other anecdotes that come to mind from your time up to this point and perhaps beyond um, with the choir, with the church? Um, I was the chair of the Social Justice Committee when we had the 2009 General Assembly here in Salt Lake City. And we were allowed to make decisions about which charity in Utah would get the proceeds from when they passed the plate during the Sunday service. And we knew it would be quite a lot of money, so we got to sit and decide who would get that. And we decided on the, uh, the Utah Pride Center. So that was one of the high points for me, is that the woman, uh, Valerie Larrabee, who was the head of Utah Chair at Utah Pride Center, and I got to walk into GA with those great big banners at the very first, and we raised thirty thousand dollars for Pride Center. That's so that was a that was a huge that was a huge one for me. It was the social justice work that I was able to do at the church, and and I got to say, Dr. David Zabriskie's Requiem, singing that Requiem in two thousand eleven. And again, a few years ago, he wrote it especially for us. And I even, I even talked to people who heard that requiem and thought that that was one of the high points of their experience with the church. And we got to sing it. And it was, um, I don't know, that there's, you, you don't get a whole lot better than that. Singing that kind of beautiful music with people you love and people who love you in a setting that's totally your home. It was probably the singing that requiem that was the high part so far. If you, if you want a community that will nurture you and support you, that will give you back everything you give them and double it, you should be with this community. Not only will it allow you to be a good citizen of the world, and give you the tools and experience to do that, you can rest in their love and their support. I mean, these the members of this church really love and support each other. So that's what you can get if you're willing to give. If you're willing to take the deep dive, um, you'll get it back. You'll get it back hundredfold. Well, I'll tell you one anecdote that cannot go on this. <laughs> When I first started coming, and Sylvia Behrens was there, and she did, um, she did a sermon on female sexuality. And she asked me to sing the Pointer Sisters, I'm So Excited. You know that tune? Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, I'm still kind of a Mormon girl, you know? Okay, well, Sylvia was doing a, Sylvia was doing a sermon on uh, Lilith. And it had a lot to do with women's sexuality. And she asked me to sing the Pointer Sisters, I'm So Excited, which is all about women's sexuality. And I was still kind of new to the church. And um, I was waiting, as you can go into the sanctuary on the right side, There's the you go through the door up to the pulpit, and I'm waiting right there on that door to go outside and sing out into the sanctuary and sing that song. And I said, I just can't do this. I cannot walk into a church service and sing this song. It doesn't belong in church. And then Savoy said, you're a Unitarian now. Anything goes. <laughs> said, okay. So I walked out and <laughs> I sang the song. And sure enough, 
pretty much anything goes. Could you sing it for us now? <laughs> <laughs> and if you go real, and if you move real slow, I'll let it go. I'm so excited. I just can't hide it. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I want you. I want you. It goes on from there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to lose control, and I think I like it. <laughs> Saying that in church. But my belief is that if any religions have a chance of being relevant into the future, it will be progressive liberal religion. Because the issues that we talk about and care about won't ever go away unless, unless humanity becomes perfect. You know, we'll always be concerned about social justice. We'll always be concerned about taking care of each other. You know, we'll always be concerned about, about our environment. I doubt that's ever going to change. And so I think the other religions that are focused basically on more supernatural things and more moral codes that get less and less relevant and less and less followed by a lot of people, you know, we only have moral codes that say be good to each other, be good to yourself and be good to each other and be good to the world. And I think that's a relevant message forever. So.